purpose, the reason for which something exists. Each one of our purposes were created long before anyone walked the earth. All of us hold it, yet sometimes we spend our whole lives searching for it. Our purpose is to glorify God in our mission, our relationships, and our legacy in Christ. Even in the midst of change, times of uncertainty, and times of joy, this is what it means to live life on purpose. Good morning, church. Hope you had a great holiday weekend. I imagine it was different than the way you celebrated in years past. But there is one thing about America, one thing that's part of the fabric of who we are. It's built into the thread of our culture that no worldwide pandemic could take away. And that's that there was a National Treasure Marathon on TV this weekend. Um, I don't know about you guys, but National Treasure is not one of my favorite, it's not like in my top 10 favorite movies, but it is one of those movies that if it's on, I have to watch it. I can't not watch it. And what I love about the movie besides Nicolas Cage saying, you know, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence. That was my best Nicolas Cage. Um, but it, besides that is, is, is the unfolding mission that happens in National Treasure. They believe that they have a task they have to do, which is get the Declaration of Independence. And once they get it, they realize that there's more to it that has to be done. So they get the Declaration of Independence. Uh, they realize that there's a map on it. They put the lemon juice on it, and it begins to unfold more direction, more clarification of what their mission is. But then they get a hold of these bad boys right here, and they begin to see even more of what the mission is. So just looking through them regularly, they see even more unfold that was already there, and it's being clarified for them. And then he figures out that once you begin to layer them in different ways, you see even more of what the mission is. What was once a blank back of the Declaration of Independence has now been clarified for them. What was once distorted is now clear to them. This is where you go. This is what you do. Which brings us to our first point today, which is this. The habitual practices in our life are either distorting or clarifying our created purpose. The things we do on a regular basis, our habits, our practices that we are doing regularly, they're either distorting our purpose or clarifying our purpose. They're either the Benjamin Franklin glasses showing us deeper what we're supposed to do or we're staring at the back of a blank decoration of independence. So the things we do on a regular basis, they're either distorting and distracting or clarifying and directing. And I don't know about you guys, but I think the church, I think us as individuals needs less distorting distractions and more clarifying direction. And I believe we'll see that here today, that the practices of the people of God, different than the practices of the world, the practices of the people of God propel the purpose of God, and we'll see that here today in Acts 13. Acts 13 is 52 verses, so we're going to do some drone footage of Acts 13. We're going to go, we're going to summarize some things, but there's going to be some times where we drop that drone down and look deeper into what's God saying and what's God saying to us here as a church. So I'm going to start and read uh, chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, your devices, you could look there with me now. Verse 1 says this, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manian, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiped the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and set them off. 
The first thing I want us to notice in this passage is a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jeff was talking about uh, what heaven would look like, the diversity of heaven, every nation, tribe, and tongue represented. This is the future for us as the people of God. But we see a picture of that here in one of the most influential churches in the New Testament, the church at Antioch. We see the complex, beautiful diversity of the individual members of the church of God united as the people of God. Here in just these verses, if you were to research where everybody is from, you see God displaying his ethnic, cultural, and testimonial diversity at this church here in Antioch. That is a beautiful picture of God showing all the different types of people here on one mission, which is the purpose of God. Because we do live in a Revelation 3 world. We live in a fallen world. But our goal for us as the church is to live as if the kingdom has already come. To be a picture of that future kingdom in the here and the now. The way that it is in Revelation 7. The way that it is here in the church at Antioch. But as you, as you look at this passage, is I, when I'm, whenever I'm studying a passage... I usually study a little less than 52 verses. I I like to daily read a smaller portion so I can sit on it, so I can meditate on it. And in this passage, I I ask three questions. I always ask these same three questions of the text when I'm studying. What does this passage teach me about who God is? What does this passage teach me about who I am? What does it teach me about God's nature? What does it teach me about man's nature? And what practices does it call me to do if anything, what practices are there for me to emulate? And when you look in these passages, this passage, we're going to focus on what are the practices we see here to emulate. So right off the bat, in these first three verses, you see regular practices of the people of God. The first thing you see is that they are worshiping, they are praying, they are fasting, and then you see the practice of missional living. So let's look at these for a second. So the first one is they are worshiping. So they've come together in this this weekly, regular rhythm of coming together as the people of God, the same way that we are coming together here now. What we do on a regular basis is to come, we worship together as the people of God in the presence of God. That's what we're doing here now. It's what we're doing on lives, what we're doing in the family worship room. We are coming together as the people of God in the presence of God. And that act alone changes us, it guides us, and begins to clarify our purpose together communally as the people of God. Then it says they were praying and fasting. It says they were fasting, but you hardly ever see fasting without prayer uh, underlining what they are doing. So they're praying and fasting. And what they're doing here is, is when we have a regular rhythm of prayer where we are talking to God, We are with God and we are hearing from God. What they're doing here is listening. They are praying for clarity and directive. So they they have this practice of listening to what God would have them do here in this passage. Now for us here, as we seek to have habitual practices that clarify for us our purpose, it is really hard today in our culture to hear when we are drowning in noise. Right now in in your pockets or in your purse or at least close by you, you have a weapon of mass noise with you. You have a weapon of mass noise with you. It's your phone. It's right there beside you. And with that device that you have, we are overwhelmed with information, with noise, with just constant confusion and distracting noise. And it's disorienting. Is disorienting. And I mean, just think about it. Emails, text, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I mean, it's just exhausting even listening them, listing them to you. And they're constantly overwhelming us. And it's distracting and it's disorienting. But here's the thing. All of those things are trying to say something to us. All of those things are trying to say something to us, which brings us to our next question is, what are you listening to? What are the things that you've chose? Because these are things you chose to put in part of your life. What are you listening to? Because they are all telling you something. 
But the hard part is when we have so many things that are trying to tell us something, we just simply get distracted. Trust me, I know, I have three kids under seven years old. There's noise all the time. If, if, somehow when they're sleeping, there's still noise. I don't, I don't understand. But like when all three of them are at peak pitch of level and they're all talking to me and my wife is trying to say something to me at the same time, add in that I have my phone in my hand at the same time, I cannot hear anything that she is saying. I have to put the phone down. I have to ask the kids to be quiet. And I have to focus on her and say, hey, what was it that you were saying to me? And the same thing is true of our relationship with the Lord. We have so many distractions. We have the phone in our hand. We have noise from all sides when God would have us stop and listen. So we have to ask the question, what are we listening to? So back to we have the habitual practices in our life that are either clarifying or distorting. We have these habitual practices. Have you ever gone into a room and you're like, this is what I'm going to the room for. You go into the room and then you get distracted by something else. You grab that thing. You leave the room and realize Hey, what was that I even went in that room for? It happens all the time. I call it Tuesday. But you get distracted by something and you forget the mission why you went into the room. It's the same reason why companies are always talking about mission drift. We have to continually to put our mission, vision, and values in every meeting that we have. We have to continually cast that vision so we don't drift from the mission that we've been called to, which is sell widget A, or focus on problem A, because if we don't have this focus on our mission, vision, and values, what's going to happen is we're going to end up focusing here and forget the thing that we were there for, our purpose. And I believe that is true of the church today. I mean, the larger church uh, in the world, and I mean, for us as a church and for us as individuals, there is the danger, there's a temptation of mission drift. Why are we here and what are we doing? So let me ask you this, which one of these is more clarifying practice, more clarifying habit for you? Spending intentional time with your creator or spending intentional time with the creator of West Wing? Is it three hours a, of news a day or an hour of prayer and fasting? Now don't get me wrong. I love Netflix. I love West Wing. It's one of my favorite shows. I love movies. I started this whole sermon with an illustration about a movie. I'm not anti-movie. I'm not anti-news. I'm not anti-Netflix. But if our intake of Netflix and the news outweighs our intake of time with the Lord, we are going to be malnourished and full of mission drift. Because our practices point to our purpose. Our practices clarify our purpose. And what's happened is as, as we become the people of God, we've traded what the world's purpose was for you because the world does have a purpose for you. All those noises in your life have a purpose for you. But as the people of God, we've traded the world's purposes for us and taken up God's purpose for us. And we see this in Acts 13 in these first three verses. They're worshiping, they're praying, they're fasting, they're listening, and God speaks. And where does he speak? He clarifies the mission to them. He reminds them. He clarifies them what was already revealed. On the back of the Declaration of Independence, the map was there. It just needed to be clarified for them. It already existed, and God does this here in this passage. He clarifies what he had already told them back in Acts chapter 1. That was the first part of our series. It's going to be on the screen. Let me read it to you. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God has said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work. Not a work, but the work. He is clarifying for us. What we see here in Acts 13 is the opening to the last part of Acts 1.8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, this is the beginning of the ends of the earth. God is clarifying to them through the practices. And this is known as Paul's first missionary journey. Paul uh, went on three missionary journeys, first, second, and third. But, and that's important for us to know where he went. But I don't, I don't like to talk about his missionary journeys. I call it Paul's life. 
This is Paul's life, and it should be our life as well. Because look, look what happens, but just a side note, look what happens after God says, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, do this work. What do they respond by doing? Prayer and fasting. These habitual practices of clarification of our purpose. So this is Paul's life. Our life should look like that because the practice of missional living is not one just given to the church at Antioch. It's not one just given to Paul and Barnabas. It's one given to everybody in this room, which brings us to this point that God has called us all to an intentional missional purpose that starts on our street and flows to the ends of the earth. All. There is nobody in this room, there's nobody watching online, there is nobody that's exempt from this call on our life to the work of missional living where God has placed us. So if you start look at verse 4, they go out, they start proclaiming, they, they obey, they move forward. And like Bilbo leaving the Shire for the first time on his unexpected journey, him and his company immediately encounter trolls hanging out. Paul and Barnabas immediately encounter a troll here. They encounter Bar Jesus, who was a sorcerer who worked with the governor. And the governor actually wanted to hear, hear from Paul and Barnabas. But he's also hearing from Bar Jesus. So in that same idea, the governor who wants to hear from Paul and Barnabas is also hearing from Bar Jesus. He has both of these noises. He's listening to both parties. One is distorting. One is clarifying. So the governor wants to hear it. And in verse 9, we see for the first time, Saul called Paul. Now, a lot of times we think about Paul's name, that it was immediately when he uh, met Jesus on the road to Damascus, that his name changed when he became a follower of Christ. There is a connotation that his life is different now. But I think here in this passage, most people had two names. They had, especially if they lived in, the, in this time, he was Saul, his Jewish name, and he also had Paul, which would be his Gentile name. And really the name change, most scholars believe, is a missional one so that he could be all things to all people, the way Scripture says that he is now Paul with his mission to the Gentiles. And it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, also fulfilling the promise from Acts 1-8 that the Spirit be with you, the promise from the Great Commission that the, I will go with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The Spirit is there with them as they begin this opening of the ends of the earth. And what does Paul do? He speaks truth to a prophet who's spreading false truth. And that is our call as well into the culture to speak truth to the culture where there is falsity, but in love. It's easy for us to miss that second part. It's not to win an argument. It's not to destroy. It's not to uh, roast. The purpose is to speak truth in love. And what Paul is doing here, he actually pronounces blindness on Bar Jesus. And he called Bar Jesus, which means son of salvation. Paul says, now actually you're son of the devil and I pronounce blindness on you. Now think about this for a second. This is Paul who was once blind and the scales fell off his eyes and then he could see, then pronounces blindness on Bar Jesus. And you got to imagine with Paul's missionary heart that he hoped the outcome would be the same for Bar Jesus as it was for him in the end by speaking truth to him. And what happens? The governor, the proconsul, he believed. He believed because he saw Paul live the gospel and he saw Paul preach the gospel here. So moving into verse 13, in, in verse 13 through 41, you see Paul and Barnabas move from Antioch in Syria to Antioch in Turkey. So they're moving along this journey. And when they get there, they go to the synagogue and in the synagogue, they're, they're reading the word aloud. And as was regular practice, in verse 15, it says this, they, they asked Paul and Barnabas to speak by saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation or a word of encouragement for the people, please speak. And when I'm studying a passage, I ask those three questions of the text, but I always, always find one verse. What's the one verse that that the Lord just put on my heart. What stands out to me? And as I was studying this passage, me and Jacob Thomas, who's a resident here, we studied this passage together for a while, and this one just kept haunting me over and over. So I wrote it on a note card and I took it with me. Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation or encouragement for the people, please 
speak. And as I prayed and meditated on it, it just, God put on my heart that the world with so much pain, with so much hurt, with so much hopelessness is crying out to us as the church, as Christians, brothers and sisters, if you have a word of encouragement for us in today's culture, in this crisis, in this world, brothers, if you have a word of encouragement, please speak. Our cities are crying out to us as Christians. You say you have the hope hidden for all generations. Brothers, if you have a word of encouragement, please speak. Our neighbors who are wrestling with hopelessness are calling out to us with their lives. Brothers and sisters, if you have a word of encouragement, speak. Do you want to know what your purpose is? in this world is to stand up and speak. The answer should be, as the world calls out for us to speak a word of encouragement, the answer should be the church stood up and spoke. It should be that us as individuals stood up and spoke because what Paul did, he stood up and spoke. And in verses 16 through 41, he gives the, they ask for a word of encouragement and he gives this long sermon. I'm not going to read it, but I'll challenge you to, to take 16 through 41 this week, read it, pray over it, meditate on it. But let me give you a summary of what he says. He gives the, a picture of redemptive history, of God's sovereignty of all of history. You frequently see the phrase, God gave, God gave, God gave, that God was in control of all of history, but every one of his promises, every one of his movements is pointing to one one specific promise, which is the coming of a Savior who is Jesus Christ, who came and he lived, and the purpose of him coming was for him to live, die on the cross, and the purpose of his message was to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and the freedom from that sin that entangled you. So as the world is speaking to us and saying, brothers and sisters, if you have a word of encouragement, speak. To me, to you here today, what better word of encouragement do I have that your sins are forgiven and that you are free from that sin to go and live on mission? So maybe you're here today and the only reason you're here today is so you could hear those two things. That God sent his son and all of history was pointed to that so that your sins would be forgiven. And not only that, that sin that entangled you before, you are now free from it. What better word of encouragement do I have for you? In fact, what better word of encouragement do we have for the world than Jesus crucified for the forgiveness of sins and for the freedom of sin? God has called us all into this missional way of being in the world that Paul was living, that Barnabas was living. He's called us all into that way of being in the world. The way he called this family on this video to live out missionally from the ends of the earth to where they live right now. Watch this. Well, we are Don and Cynthia Storrs. And uh, we're here in Nolensville, and we attend a local campus here. I think really in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a movement, you know, the Jesus Freak movement, but that was how we came to the Lord. And then eventually hearing about Europe, right. we felt like the, those people are just like us. They Correct. think they know God, but they, they really only know a shadow. I know crisis needed throughout the world, but that's probably the most unreached continent, as prolific as it may be. We initially went to the French-speaking side of Belgium. We were the only people of faith in our community, and we were a faith that was generally persecuted by the, the majority faith that was there. It's really wonderful to try to mesh with those in the, in the community and their activities. And I was very fortunate. I had not played a trombone since my high school days, and yet I brought it with me. Why, I have no idea why, until my son's saxophone teacher saw a trombone sitting up in my uh, house, and he said, who's trombone? He said, it's daddy's. And so he asked me if I wanted to play in a uh, Tommy, uh, Tom, Tommy, uh, Tom, Tommy Dorsey, Tommy big Dorsey, band. big band song. Big band. I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. 
I did it. I did it for three years. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, through that, I had an, an opportunity to uh, get to know these men and a few ladies in the program, and it was really a great opportunity. And I had a chance to share our faith with them. I think about Paul, and he used what he had as a bridge to the community. He was a trained teacher. He knew the Jewish law really well, so he ended up going first to the synagogues. You know go with what you have. Um, I ended up doing a lot of teaching because I was a teacher, um, English as a second language. So just that idea of what is it you have in your hand? People ever thinking, well, I could never do that. Anything that is needed here in any occupation is needed overseas. And there's always a place that people can serve. We need to recognize our the potential relationships with people in our community. And when we moved here to our, our home areas nearby, uh, we made it a point to try to meet the, uh, those in our, our surrounding community. And uh, that's all it is. We, st we may start off small, but we're looking forward to de developing and enhancing that relationships. So enjoyed getting to know Don. We've been in a discipleship reading group together. And, and one of the main focuses of the book we're reading is that we should do three things, that we should be with Jesus, that we should be like Jesus, and we should do what Jesus did. And Cynthia and Don portray that beautifully of living that missional life the way Paul did, the way God calls us all to do. And so we think about that. What does that practically look like for us? So if we practically see the call of God for us to be uh, influenced for the gospel in the world, what does that look like for us? Well, this is the truth right here, that we all have circles of influence that God has intentionally placed us in for the advancement of the kingdom. We all have circles of influence that God put us there for a reason. You live where you live, you work where you work, the team that your kids are on or that you coach, the Walgreens you go to, everything in your life, you were placed there for a reason. This is your circle of influence. And look at this quote. God never gets the address wrong. Let that sink into you, the way water sinks into dry soil, the way the water uh, to a plant that needs water, how it perks up uh, uh, right when you give it the water. Let that perk your soul up, that God never gets the address wrong, that you live exactly where you live because God puts you there, and that the people around you are exactly there because God put them there. God never gets the address wrong. And right now in our life, in these circles of influence, I believe our culture is in a place that is ripe for renewal. You ever seen a giant sequoia tree? The largest trees in the world. But did you know that a giant sequoia tree cannot reproduce without fire? It takes fire for a giant sequoia tree, one of the oldest trees, largest trees in the world, has to re reproduce through fire. What happens is the fire comes in, it opens up the cone, releases the seed into the ground. The fire puts the nutrients in the ground for the, for the seed to begin to reproduce. The forest fire cuts away the brush from the canopy so the sun can come in and begins to grow the largest and oldest trees in the world. It takes fire to reproduce a giant sequoia. It takes crisis to renew this tree. And Mark Sayers, a cultural commentator that if you've never read anything about him, you should, always says this, that crisis precedes renewal. Crisis precedes renewal. And that's for us individually. Paul's life, he had crisis in his life, and it renewed his mission to be on the purpose for God to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. In my life, it was crisis that led me to become a follower of Christ. So individually, it's usually crisis that gives us the moment of renewal. If we have a renewing of our faith, it comes through crisis. Often at times, it also happens communally that it comes through crisis. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm not sure what a crisis is if we're not in one now that the world is ripe for renewal. And our circle of missional influence has two types of people, either people that need to be reminded of the truth of the gospel or who need the hope of the gospel for the first time. So when we think about these circles of influence, let's put this graphic on the screen. This is our 
love everyone always circles of influence. How can we love everyone always with the gospel? So when we did the love everyone always summer challenge, we looked through these circles of how can we intentionally mobilize people in these areas. So look at this first one, our neighbors. So if God never gets the address wrong, you were put where you live for a reason. Now, sharing the gospel with your neighbors is more than just knowing their name, but it's not less. So think about it for a second. Can you name the person that lives directly across from you? What about the person who lives beside you? What about this side? What about behind you? You live in an apartment. Can you name the person who lives above you, below you, beside you? If you can't, if you answered no, I, I can't do that to any of those, then that's your challenge. God has put you there for a reason to at the very least know their names because I truly believe the best way to share the gospel is relationally with knowing the people in your life, inviting them into your life and you into theirs. So knowing their name. Think about neighborhoods. So your, your neighbors, what about your neighborhood? We have three campuses here in this area, which means we have people in almost every single neighborhood and apartment complex in this whole area, which means we have missionaries sent out and placed in almost every neighborhood and apartment complex in this area with the truth hidden for all ages, which is Jesus Christ and his gospel of grace. So think about this. Not only that, we have a community group in almost every apartment complex and neighborhood across this area. So what would it look like if individuals in these neighborhoods and community groups in this neighborhood intentionally focused on loving the neighborhood, sharing the gospel? Like what if we started seeing baptisms here every Sunday? It was like, where did that come from? Oh, I shared the gospel with my neighbor. I made a difference in my neighborhood. A community group was intentionally about loving the neighborhood. And we started to see new believers coming through intentionally focusing on our neighborhoods. What about community? Your community is the part of your life, the Walgreens that you go to regularly, the gas station you always go to, where you work, the baseball team that you coach, this is your community. Now, oftentimes when we go to places like Walgreens, we go in like bank robbers. We want to get in, we want to get out with the stuff that we have, and we don't want anybody to see us. And now we get to wear a mask when we do it. But that's not what God's called us to. Yes, there are times when you just need to get in and get out. But this, God placed you by that Walgreens. God placed you by that gas station for you to be intentional about them knowing what God is doing in your life. And then our city. What about our city? Put this point up here. We have God-sized dreams of building the kingdom in our city. When, we think, when I think about the city, is, is this city better because Rolling Hills Community Church is in it? What are we doing to have God-sized dreams to impact the city in all three of our campuses. So this is kind of how I think about it. Like, what would it look like for Rolling Hills to work to end hunger in Williamson County? You know, we've had food drives over the summer. It's not just to do something. It's because we really want to work with GraceWorks in one generation away to end hunger. What can we do to end hunger? What can we do as individuals to work against pe kids going to bed hungry at night? And we want to we end homelessness and restore dignity. That's why we work with Shower Up and the Bridge Ministry is to fight the epidemic of homelessness and restore dignity to people and give them a new purpose in life. And then value in education. That's why we work with Path Project is to value education. But also what would it look like if we saw the schools where our kids go to school, and I know it may look different this year, as a place God placed you missionally. Which what that means is if you are on the mission field at your kid's school, that means when the school does something that you may not like, your response should look drastically different than the person who's not a follower of Christ. So what if we were to begin to see our community, our city differently? And our nation, what about how can Rolling Hills in the next year make an impact in our nation? Does it mean sending out more church planners from this church? Does it mean supporting church planners? What can we do to have a God-sized vision to impact the nation with the gospel and then the world? We know that our, our focus with our world international missions is through Justice and Mercy International, and we can't go there now, but we have Paul and Barnabas's on the ground there now in the Amazon and Moldova, and we can fast and pray for them. 
But I do have a vision of one day when we are back sending international missionaries that every single community group at Rolling Hills is living out Acts 13, one through three, where they pray and they fast and say, who from our group is going overseas to international missions? And they begin to fast and pray and God reveals it to them. And that community group is the one who raises the money together to send that person on missions and they fast and pray while they were gone. What would it look like if every single community group sent out international missionaries and they were the ones who mobilized, prayed, and fasted and sent them on their way? So what happened when Paul and Barnabas do this? These last 10 verses quickly hit them. The people wanted more. They begged that they would teach these things. And almost the whole city gathered to hear it. The gospel began to spread throughout the whole region. And the gospel was, I said, this is the beginning of the ends of the earth. Going to the ends of the earth, this is the gospel to the Gentiles. And think about this truth really quick. If it wasn't for Paul and Barnabas taking the gospel to the Gentiles, you would not be in this room today. So this is my challenge to you. Who will be sitting in a room like this 100 years from now because your faithfulness to the mission and to the gospel? So as we close this idea of us being sent on mission, I want to I point out two things for you as we end. Is that the practices of the people of God clarifies our purpose. When we wake up in the morning, and we are intentionally spending time with the Lord when we're praying, when we're fasting, when we're in the word, when we're worshiping on a weekly basis. These things clarify for us that God, I know God has sent me on mission. But when we do these things, God says, it's Bill. That's who I've called you to. It's Sally. It's your neighbor that you don't your name. God clarifies our mission of where he would have us go. And it also does this. It renews our purpose. Every day when we wake up and we spend time in the word, it renews us that I know what my purpose is today. We're not spinning in distractions and distortion. We focused on God speaking to us and say, renewing the fire of the gospel to respond to this world that is in desperate need of renewal every day that it renews us as we go and seek to renew. And then this last thing, that you are exactly where you are for a reason. And I pray that as we were here today, God put someone on your heart. And this is my challenge to you. That person that God's put on your heart today to reach out to and love with the gospel, text that person to yourself right now. Take out your phone and text to them and let you know so you have that reminder there for you, like God has called me to this person. And in closing, I have this one, just this one last thing for you. Brothers and sisters, if you have a word of encouragement, speak. Let's pray. Father, if there's anyone here today that needs to take hold of the truth that they are forgiven from sin and they are freed from sin, Lord, I pray you overwhelm their hearts with the grace and the mercy found in you, Jesus. And for all of us, Lord, I pray that you would light us on fire for the gospel to take it to everyone that you have put around us, God, that we would see our life as a mission field, Lord. As Paul was a light to the Gentiles, Lord, you would make us a light to the world because your name is a light that pushes back all darkness. Lord, as we share the gospel, we are pushing back lostness. We are pushing back darkness, Lord. We know that at the end of all things, your name will be lifted high. Let that first start in our hearts and spread like fire to the people around us and to the ends of the earth, Lord. Because there's one name above all, and that is the name of Jesus. And let us live like we truly believe that. Amen.